Um, thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank the McKernans for asking me to participate in this and also for being very wonderful colleagues. Uh, and as Brian said, I'm going to be talking about the role of cannabidiol in the treatment of refractory pediatric epilepsy. Uh, and this has been a huge focus of our work over the past three years. Um, so it's really an honor to be able to come and talk with you about what we've been doing. Um, importantly, I have been very involved with GW Pharma in these clinical trials and the expanded access program. So those are my disclosures. Uh, and then I thought it'd be good to start, since this is a mixed audience, first kind of really describing what epilepsy is. Um, first of all, a seizure is a disturbance in the electrical activity of the brain. And epilepsy is simply defined as two or more unprovoked seizures occurring greater than 24 hours apart. And epilepsy is actually a spectrum of disorders. There's many, many different types of seizures. There's many, many causes of seizures, um, both in children and adult, with some overlap, but some quite distinct. And there's also many epilepsy syndromes, as well as types of epilepsy. Medically refractory or intractable seizures are defined as seizures that are not controlled by anticonvulsant medications or are controlled only by medications that have significant side effects. And it's estimated that one third of individuals, children and adults, uh, who develop epilepsy will go on to have intractable or refractory epilepsy. Looking then at the how, what an unmet need for treatments are in this country, the incidence of epilepsy in the United States per year is estimated at 150,000 new cases. And the prevalence of epilepsy in the United States is about 2.2 million people. The prevalence of epilepsy worldwide is greater than 65 million people. And the estimate of prevalence of refractory epilepsy in the United States is about 730,000 people. Worldwide, it's 21.7 million people. Um, so quite a significant health care issue. Currently, in 2017, we do have options for children and adults when they develop refractory epilepsy. Uh, in fact, medications, we've had 17 new medications become available over the past 20 years. Uh, there's also an important role for dietary therapy, which can be very effective in treating epilepsy, as well as our neurostimulators, both the vagus nerve stimulator and the responsive neurostimulator. Uh, and there's also a role for epilepsy surgery. Uh, but in spite of these treatments, particularly the 17 new medications, uh, the incidence of refractory epilepsy has really not changed over time, um, which demonstrates that there continues to be really a significant unmet need uh, for effective, safe, and tolerated therapies. So then kind of making a case for cannabidiol, um, first of all, I think most of this audience knows, but the medical community is kind of naive and ignorant of, as this is not really a new idea. And so we've had some discussion today. I'm also going to just briefly review through history uh, some of the references to the treatment of epilepsy. Uh, then we'll look briefly at the mechanisms of action. Uh, do they make sense as a possible treatment for epilepsy? look at the preclinical studies that have been done in the animal models of epilepsy, and then turn to what is the clinical data, uh, and then what do we still need to know. Uh, so as this audience knows, cannabis has actually been used as a medical treatment for thousands of years. Uh, the first reference in the use of epilepsy was in texts in 2200 BCE from Samaria, uh, and then from the Middle East, a kind of also descriptions in 1100 and 1400 uh, CE about using cannabis specifically in the treatment of seizures. A more recent history in 1842, O'Shaughnessy reported that cannabis reduced infantile convulsions, uh, then suggesting also that it could be effective treatment in infants with seizures as well as others, uh, as well as hydrophobia, lockjaw, and rheumatism. And in 1856, McMeans reported the successful use of a tincture of cannabis indica in four children with epilepsy, including a seven-week female. In 1881, William Gowers, who is a very, very famous child neurologist, and every neurologist knows his name, uh, reported that cannabis had been recommended for epilepsy by Russell Reynolds in 1861 as a sometimes, though not very frequently useful, small value as an adjunct to the bromide, but is sometimes of considerable service given separately. Uh, and Gowers actually administered cannabis in many cases uh, with the effect of delaying the paroxysms and mitigating the severity in some individuals. And actually in the 1800s and early 1900s, I think that cannabis was used very frequently and widely uh, in the United States and elsewhere in the treatment of epilepsy. Uh, and then as we all know, in 1851 actually, the U.S. dispensary, cannabis, com cannabis compounds were suggested for neuralgia, depression, hemorrhage, pain relief, muscle spasms, convulsive disorders, uh, and other ailments. And in 1860, the Ohio Medical Society 
Committee on Cannabis Indica said that efficacy was claimed for infantile convulsions, epilepsy, and many other disorders. So again, amounting evidence over time, including the 1800s, that this could be a very effective treatment for epilepsy, very important then because at that time there were only, um, really only one medication available in the treatment of epilepsy. And then, as we all know, and I was actually sad to learn that it was my blue state of Massachusetts in 1911 uh, that became the first state to outlaw cannabis in the setting of the prohibition of alcohol, and the other states quickly followed uh, with the marijuana prohibition laws. And then, as we all know, in 1970, the U.S. Controlled Substance Act, pac uh, passed, Act passed, classifying marijuana as a drug with no accepted medical use. And I think, as we've discussed today, as all of us are aware, then that only not put kind of incredible limitations on this clinical use, um, but also a research into the possible benefits of the compounds in the cannabis plant. In 1996, California became the first state to legalize medical marijuana, and by 2015, medical marijuana was legalized in 23 states, again regulated at the state level by the DEA, and CBD specifically was made legal in an additional 16 states. And I think that this has been a fabulous and incredible movement to watch because I think a lot of this was really driven by the patient community um, that really wanted access to this treatment, not only for their children with epilepsy, but for other disorders. And I think as we're all aware, um, over the past several years, there's been increasing anecdotal reports about the efficacy of medical marijuana, especially the CBD enriched formations in the treatment of pediatric epilepsy. Uh, and this has been, I think every child neurologist and most neurologists in this country um, have not seen a patient with epilepsy in the past three or four years without the patient or their parents asking um, for access to this as a treatment for their seizure disorder. Uh, so Catherine Jacobs and Brenda Porter kind of did a Facebook uh, survey and solicited data um, on Facebook survey of 150 families uh, whose children had been using can cannabidiol-rich cannabis to treat their drug-resistant seizures. They had a low response rate of only 12.7, uh, and the patients or kids included Dravet syndrome kids, uh, Deuce syndrome, which is a myoclonic astatic epilepsy, another very highly refractory epilepsy, one with Lennox Gasto, uh, which we'll be hearing about later by Dr. Davinsky, one with idiopathic epilepsy. Uh, and this population that responded to the survey had been on an average of 12 prior anticonvulsant medications. Overall, 84% noted a seizure de decreased frequency on the CBD, uh, including two that had experienced a com complete remission. Uh, so that's a low number, but remember these children had been on a prior of over, you know, mean of 12 medications, so really highly medically refractory. Uh, and then cannabidiol was associated with adverse events, and drowsiness was uh, fairly common, as was fatigue, uh, and also was noticed some positive benefits, better mood, increased alertness, and improved sleep. A similar study was done by the folks at UCLA, and they also did an online survey of parents of children with epilepsy who had also used CBD products. They received 117 responses. The mean latency from the onset of epilepsy to the use of CBD was five years. Uh, and um, kind of these kids also were refractory, having been on a mean of eight prior medications. And their population included 53 kids with infantile spasms, which is also considered a catastrophic or malignant form of epilepsy, um, or lennox gasto syndrome. And similar to the other um, survey, 85 reported a reduction in seizure frequency, including 14 who became seizure-free. And again, many reported improved sleep, alertness, and mood. Um, both of these studies did remark that there were limitations. Um, they were subject to participation bias, the people who responded to the survey. Um, it's unknown formulations of cannabidiol products these kids were receiving, uh, and there was also no control group. Um, and at that time, there was a lot of pressure, and uh, you know, it was a really a concern to us, as John said earlier, as being child neurologists, of wanting to do right by our patients and making sure what they're taking is safe, well-tolerated, um, as well as efficacious. Um, and kind of as, okay, okay and, and then kind of looking then, at th does it work via the endocannabinoid receptors? As we've talked about, and you all know better than I do, uh, cannabis is the only plant species that contains cannabinoids. Uh, and we've already discussed the cannabinoid receptor family, uh, but this has had me interested for many years in could this be a potential treatment for epilepsy, uh, since these plants contain chemicals, as we've discussed, that our brains have receptors for. Uh, and we've already discussed the endocannabinoids, um, but kind of could they be playing a role somehow in epilepsy? 
uh, and there is some evidence. Uh, lower levels of venantamide have been found in the CSF of patients with newly diagnosed temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, and tissue resected during epilepsy surgery was found to have lower levels of the CB1 receptor mRNA and also reduced expression of the enzyme responsible for the synthesis of 2-AG. Um, but as we've discussed, cannabidiol does not appear to exert its main neuronal effects through the activation of CB1 receptors. And in fact, it may function as indirect antagonists at high levels. Um, so of course, there is a lot of interest, and I know many people in the room work on this, but what could be the possible mechanisms then of cannabidiol in the treatment of seizures? And it has been shown that it decreases presynaptic release of glutamate, glutamate being the main excitatory amino acid in the brain. And it's been shown to do this by binding to the members of the TRIP family of cation channels. It's also been shown to activate serotonin receptors, inhibit adenosine reuptake, both of which we think are somehow involved in epilepsy. It's also thought that it could have anti-inflammatory properties, antioxidant properties, uh, and there's some interest that it could modulate the mTOR pathway, um, which we know is a pathway involved in a disorder called tuberous sclerosis complex, where 85% of those individuals have epilepsy off from the refractory, uh, and it may also be involved in other forms of epilepsy. So what have the animal models shown us? Um, CBD has actually been shown to be effective in several acute seizure models. Um, any drug undergoing development for seizures um, is used in several different animal models of induced seizures, including the PTZ model, MES, pilocarpine-induced temporal lobe seizures, as well as penicillin-induced um, partial seizures. So it was effective in all of those models. Uh, there's less convincing data in chronic seizure models, um, but that is very similar to levetiracetam or Keppra, which over the what, past 15 years has become one of our most widely used and effective um, anticonvulsant medications. It's also been shown that CBD increases the after-discharge threshold and reduces the after-discharge amplitude, duration, and propagation in electrically kindled limbic seizures in rats. Um, so pretty good preclinical evidence through the animal models that this could be effective for epilepsy. Uh, so several years ago now, we became involved with GW Pharmaceuticals. Um, they, were they have a product licensed in over 30 countries in development in the United States called Sativex, which is 50% THC, 50% CBD, um, used for MS spasticity and also pain. Uh, and they were doing preclinical studies looking at cannabidiol and would, be it, would it be effective in the treatment of epilepsy. Their product, Epidiolex, is a 99% pure oil-based cannabidiol extract of constant composition, uh, and it's in a 100 milligram per mil sesame oil-based solution. So with, with GW Pharma, initial activities was the expanded access program, uh, and about f almost four years ago now, five academic centers got together with GW to discuss um, could we try and see if this would be safe and effective as well as um, tolerated in our patient population. Um, we all approached the D uh, FDA and the DEA, and each site was given permission to put 25 children on Epidiolex. Um, the initial five, 25 children we put on this treatment, um, we actually had to send biographies of each child to the FDA, describing the child, their epilepsy, what it was due to, how many medications it had been on, how many medications they were on, how many seizures they had a day. Uh, many of these kids had had epilepsy surgery, many of these kids were on dietary therapy, many of these kids had devices. Um, but all of these children continued to have pretty significant um, frequent seizure activity. So there were five initial sites and several were added afterwards. The MGH ended up enrolling 57 um, total patients in the expanded access program. The initial 25 started the medication in April of 2014, so we have many children who have now been on this as a treatment for their epilepsy um, for three years. Then, as Dr. Davinsky will talk about in the next talk, uh, GW then went on to sponsor trials in Dravet syndrome, and the results from the first RCT has been, have been released, and Dr. Davinsky will review those. And two trials in lennox gastaut syndrome, both of which have been complete, and the data has been re uh, released. Uh, and then also they are now enrolling in a trial in the treatment of refractory epilepsy and tuberous sclerosis complex. Uh, there's also planned trials in infantile spasms. 
Uh, so what I'm going to do in the rest of the time is just discuss what we've seen from the expanded access program, and this is the first data cut. Um, right now in 2017, there are over 1,000 children on Epidiolex through the expanded access program and also some of the state programs that GW has been um, working with. Uh, when we looked at this data, there were 214 kids ages 1 to 30 years who had been on greater than 12 weeks of CBD um, between January of 2014 and 2015. The purpose of this, again, it was an open, and open uh, label, expanded access, compassionate use program, uh, but we really wanted to determine the safety, tolerability, as well as the efficacy of CBD in treating our patients. Um, we ran it like a trial, uh, even though it was not. So 12 weeks safety tolerability data was available on 162 kids at this data cut, and efficacy data on 137. And this data was collected from the 11, 11 of the sites involved in the expanded access program. Again, it was compassionate use, open label. This was not a controlled trial. All of these patients had significantly medically refractory epilepsy, uh, and we did kind of come up with a shared trial design, so we'd be able to pool the data to look at the experience in the bigger population rather than each of our individual 25. So the kids were started on 2.5 to 5 milligrams per kilogram per day of the CBD, increasing weekly, initially to a goal dose of 25 milligrams per kilogram per day. If children were tolerating that, and continue to have seizures, the FDA and the DEA then gave us permission uh, at some sites to further titrate up to 50 milligrams per kilogram per day. Similar to a clinical trial, we did do a four-week baseline to kind of get a sense of the seizure frequency at baseline before starting this, and the kids had to have a minimum of four seizures during that time. Uh, and then during, that, during the trial period, all medications, diet, and VNS were stable for the month prior to enrollment and were continued kind of at stable doses throughout the 12 weeks. Uh, and parents maintained de daily detailed seizure diaries so we'd be able to really follow the data. The age range, the mean, was 10.5 years with a range of 0.9 to 26.2 years. Uh, the sex was about equal between boys and girls. Uh, the background AEDs was an average of three with a range of zero to seven. And the seizure frequency monthly, these kids were having a lot of seizures. The median was 60.5 seizures per month um, with a range of 19.6 to 151. Um, what we looked at safety and tolerability was there ad were adverse events in about 78% of the patients, uh, somnolence in about 25%, which we now appreciate is largely due to drug-drug interaction with those children on clobazam. Uh, there was a decreased appetite in some diarrhea, which actually many of these parents thought was a positive side effect because a lot of these kids with highly refractory epilepsy and significant neurologic issues often have very chronic constipation, so they viewed this as a positive in many cases. Uh, fatigue and then convulsions, and again, convulsions, this was a population of kids with highly refractory active seizure, um, so it was just probably typically their normal fluctuation of seizure activity. Serious adverse events include status is the most common, uh, again, reflecting the epilepsy condition of this population, diarrhea and weight loss. However, only five withdrew from treatment due to an adverse event. And what we saw for efficacy, we were very encouraged by. 36.5 median reduction of motor seizures over the 12-week period, somewhat higher in those children that had Dravet syndrome. And five patients became seizure-free of all motor seizures. And again, that's five, but these are some of my most highly refractory epilepsy patients. So the fact that any of them became seizure-free, I really thought was fairly miraculous. Um, 54 or 39% had a greater than 50% or were considered responders, uh, greater than 50% reduction in motor seizures. Again, some children doing extremely well. And 32 of the patients had atonic seizures, and that's when the children fall very suddenly to the ground. Uh, so those seizures carry with them the risk of significant injury, and those are the kids you usually see wearing the helmets. Um, and impressively, 56% of those with atonic seizures had a greater than 50% reduction, uh, and 16% became seizure-free. And, and this is a graph from the paper, and what you see here, the x-axis is actually looking at each individual patient. And as you can see down here, there were some children who did not seem to benefit um, from the CBD treatment. In fact, some had an increased seizure frequency. But as you can see here, many of the children had a significant increase 
with a decrease of up to 100%. This is in the last four weeks in the study treatment, uh, and then these five children were seizure-free throughout the entire time. Uh, so again, we were very enthusiastic about this. Um, this was criticized since this was open label, no placebo. There was great concern that due to the excitement and hype about the possible uh, role of CBD in treating epilepsy that there would be a significant placebo response, but as you'll see when Dr. Davinsky presents the data from the randomized controlled trials, um, it was very similar actually with the efficacy. So kind of what do we need to know? All efficacy data until recently has been anecdotal or open label, so there clearly has been a need for these randomized controlled trials. Uh, then also it's important for us to educate our families and our medical colleagues that CBD is not medical marijuana. Um, it is purified CBD that we've been using, so I think we have a lot to learn about the various medical marijuana preparations, both with regard to efficacy, safety, and tolerability in the treatment of epilepsy. And then kind of what we have learned is CBD may be effective and well-tolerated epilepsy treatment for some or many. Uh, and GW Pharmaceuticals, as we've discussed, has the CBD purified from cannabis and has these ongoing trials. Uh, and then there's a company called Zenerba Pharmaceuticals that has a transdermal CBD uh, that they're planning to trial in refractory epilepsy, fragile X, uh, and osteoarthritis. And then I think the remaining big question is what about other forms of medical marijuana? Uh, kind of, I'd really like to thank, this has been a huge amount of effort for us over the past three years. We have about 80 kids uh, either in the expanded access program in these trials, and so I'd really like to thank what I used to call our CBD team, now I think of as more of a village, uh, and several of these people are here. And then just in an extra 20 seconds, I will tell my anecdotal story. Um, one of the kids who entered our first 25 was a little girl with myoclonic astatic epilepsy. She had had daily seizures ever since developing epilepsy. Um, she'd been on every medication we had that could treat her seizures. She had the vagus nerve stimulator. Um, she was on dietary therapy. When she started CBD, she'd just gotten a $14,000 seizure dog. Uh, and the parents tracked her progress in the trial by pictures of the dog. Uh, my favorite, she got a dog laying on its back asleep with a sign behind it, 256 days unemployed. Uh, um, this, this is when the little girl was seizure free for one year. The dog is now retired on the beach. Um, and this little girl has now been seizure free since starting CBD. She's been able to taper off most of her medication. She's had such dramatic improvements, not only in seizure control, but her overall being um, that we're talking about college for her. And three years ago, that would not have been a conversation we could have had. Um, so thank you very much.